This unit's topic is going to be network security. Now, typically when I cover a network security uh, topic in a class like this, I have to talk about things like TCP IP and UDP and internet protocol addresses and a little bit of how routing works. I'm going to kind of revisit a little bit of that, but we actually already covered a lot of that stuff in earlier lectures. So I don't have to cover that extensively. So I'm going to talk about it just very briefly. Uh, but that's a lot of the topics in this class. But since we covered it in other videos, I'll let you go back and review the other videos. So you can take a look at um, you can look at the week three uh, and week two videos. I think I covered TCP extensively in week two. Uh, so you're welcome to go back and take a look at those to kind of review those uh, or take a look at the PDFs. Uh, but let's get started in this unit where we're going to kind of just, just talk a bit more about some of these network security topics. Um, you know, we already talked about the firewall in Linux. We talked about, uh, you know, a little bit of how TCP IP works and so forth previously, as I said before. But one thing I think I kind of left out before is this topic on network topologies. It's a really simple topic, but something that is an objective in the course. So I do need to cover it. And then we'll talk about some network architectures uh, and different types of attacks. And then normally when I talk about network security, a really important part of network security is going to be network encryption. But in this course, we're going to cover network encryption later in the course. We're going to cover it um, next week, actually. So in the next unit, we cover remote access. So under remote access, we'll talk about network encryption because we'll talk about things like VPNs, uh, you know, and, and enabling encryption for certain services. And then we even talk about a little bit when we talk about applications and how to secure network based applications later in the course. All right. So let's talk about topologies and networking. Really simple concept. In the old days, go back in time when we talked about network topologies. Uh, you know, a long, long time ago, you had computers all, to, you know, in basically in a bus configuration. So everyone can, uh, was uh, attached to the same wiring device, right? So you had a common bus that all the devices were along the same bus. Uh, it was kind of like Christmas lights, right? If one computer was broken, nothing else would work on that network, right? So it would wreak havoc on the network if even one computer wasn't working right, just like when one bulb goes out in your Christmas lights, right? One goes out, they all go out, right? So later on, uh, some companies came up with a better option, uh, IBM being the most famous with something called Token Ring, right? So it's a ring topology network. And the idea is that each computer was connected to the next and you form a giant ring, right? Uh, so if one of these computers was broken, it still wasn't a good thing, right? But at least you could still have communication among some of the computers on the network, although, you know, IBM's token ring was a little bit more impervious to failure than that. But that was the basic idea of a ring network. And of course, the modern networks almost always use what we call a star topology, where you have some centralized wiring device like a switch. In the old days, that would have been a hub. I'm not going to talk about hubs in this class because it's been so long since anyone's used a hub. I don't think it's really important to cover it. But you have a switch in the middle. Uh, and, and again, this was called the star topology. And typically when you have more than one star, right? So you have a whole bunch of switches, they're interconnected through a router. Now, some people will say, well, Brian, what about level three or L3 switches, right? Um, and there they're talking about, uh, I, you know, switches that can handle routing, right? Um, but I would, I would argue that those switches really are acting like a router, right? So, um, I would say it's still in the spirit of routing traffic, right? Between different networks at level two, right? Um, so that's basically what a star topology networks looks like. And even if it's a wireless network, it's still star topology, right? Because all the clients are connecting to a central device, which is the wireless router, right? Think about your home. You've got a Wi-Fi router probably at home and all your devices all connect to the same device. Um, now you might have those little pods that you can plug in around the house or something like that to extend the network, but they're really just repeaters, right? To get everything back to the same central device on your network. Usually a single star topology uh, is, is referred to as a LAN, a local area network. Um, typically when you interconnect different local area networks, uh, it typically becomes a wide area network, right? Not always, right? You can have lots of LANs within a small geographic area, right? Like for example, inside a college campus, um, it's all still the LAN, right? Um, but typically when you're traversing long distances, right? If you're, if you're interconnecting that router, between ethernet on the local area network and some other methodology on the other network. Now I had a slide in here where I talk about the different technologies to interconnect networks, how we connect to the internet, but I didn't really want to kind of weigh down this unit with that. Cause it's not really an important topic in this course. It's not an important objective in this course, but just understand there's lots of ways to connect to the internet. Typically a router is kind of bridging those two, right? It's bridging your local area network to the wider internet. 
Now we call networks where all the computers are equals, we call them peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? Um, but in this course, we're mostly talking about client server networks where some of the computers on our networks are servers and some are clients, right? We're gonna start talking about that in a little bit more detail uh, next week and the week after, mostly the week after, right? So, so two weeks from now, we start talking a lot more about services that we offer on the network and how we're gonna secure those services on a Linux machine and really, by and large, Linux, you know, the largest use of Linux is as a server, right? Now, one might argue that Linux is also Android devices, right? Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of Android devices out there, but for a course like this, we're probably mostly preparing students for uh, for work working with servers, right? That are that are going to be providing services on a network in a local area network, or or even a wide area network, you know, over a large area. All right, so let's talk a little bit about network architectures, right? I, I actually showed this slide earlier in the course, and I just want to revisit it because we're going to talk about routing here a little bit as we talk about network security. It's really important to understand routing, a little bit about how it works, right? So think back, you know, we had these different types of addresses. With routing, we don't really worry too much about the port address, right? That was the layer four address. We talked mostly about layer uh, two and three addressing, right? The MAC address or physical address and the IP address. So if I have a source and a destination, right? So in my example here, I've got a whole bunch of computers on my network and I know that I want to get a, uh, a, a uh, packet, right? And I could say packet here because we're only talking about layer three. I want to get a packet from the computer that's on the left-hand side, right? So if you look on the left, it's uh, MAC address F5, right? And I want to get it to the computer all the way on the right-hand side, which is a MAC address of A6, right? That's the machine all the way on the right. Now, the IP addresses don't really have to change as we move this, you know, this packet through that router, uh, but the the MAC address does get mangled, right? So that computer, all it knows on the left is that to get to a different network, it has to get the packet to the router. So it knows the router's MAC address because it's the default gateway, right? So it, you know, it interrogates the network to find the default gateway's uh, MAC address. A switch is going to move that packet to the router. The router is then going to figure out, you know, how do I get this packet to another network, to a node on the other network? Which interface do I have to use? It's then going to mangle the packet like once again to the correct MAC address for the actual destination and send that packet, right? And from a very high level, that's how routing works, right? From a very high level. Now, there are a lot of different protocols to support routing, right? Um, I very gave you a very simplified example there in the previous slide, but that's conceptually how it works. Uh, there are three main routing protocols that people use on routers, e, uh, EIGRP, OSPF, and uh, BGP. These are the, the three big ones, right? Uh, RIP is an older one. I don't even have it on this slide. Most devices don't really use RIP anymore. Um, but again, these are the most common routing protocols that things like Cisco routers will do, right? And there's more routers in the world other than Cisco, right? In fact, Linux can be a router, right? So Linux can support OSPF and PGP. I'm sorry, BGP. Um, and then you have that one on the bottom, uh, intermediate system to intermediate system, right? IS to IS, uh, but that's primarily used by, used by ISPs internal to their network. Um, in this class, you don't really have to know a lot about how these routing protocols work. I just want you to know that they exist and that's what defines how the routing works on most networks, right? Um, you know, how a route is determined from one place to another is using these different routing protocols. Now, networks also have authentication protocols at the uh, lower levels, right? At layer two and layer three, there is a variety of authentication protocols that are happening. Uh, the most uh, kind of the, the most common, used to be the most common and uh, widely known example is RADIUS, right? Remote authentication dial-in user service. Now RADIUS used to be in the old days all about dial-up, right? It was authentication over dial-up, but it's really kind of gotten a new life with Wi-Fi, right? Wi-Fi, you know, people, people are using Wi-Fi for RADIUS authentication. The, the neat thing about RADIUS is that you can authenticate the user before they're actually connected, right? So the idea is that you can take in a username and password and do the authentication before you actually, um, you know, put them on board on the network, right? So, so it kind of reduces that attack service a little bit. There are lots of other examples of authentication protocols for, for networks, right? Um, Diameter is another one. Uh, TACX is another one. 802.1X, which is port level access control. 
So it authenticates a user again before they connect to the network. Um, NAC or NAC network access control, um, which is how you control which devices can connect to the network. CHAP or Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol. Uh, PPP, which uses CHAP. And then you got EAP, which is uh, used by some uh, wireless network devices, right, uh, for, for WPA and WPA2. Uh, you've got protected extensible authentication protocol, which adds uh, support for SSL and TLS to uh, encrypt the authentication information, right? So lots of different options here. And again, this is not about authenticating users on computers, right? When we learned about LDAP, right? Uh, this is not like a, a surrogate for LDAP. This is this is authentication at the network level, right? So you're authenticating a device to the network. Now that said, many of many of these protocols, for example, 802.1x can actually be used with LDAP, right? So in other words, if I, you know, when I connect my Wi-Fi, right, I find the network in Wi-Fi, I connect to it, and it presents me with a username and password. That while it may use something like 802.1x to authenticate, um, you know, for that chatter between the device and the and whatever's doing the 802.1x uh, authentication, that may be interfacing to an LDAP server somewhere to do the actual user authentication, passing those credentials yet again to an LDAP server. And Active Directory, for example, supports LDAP. So you can see it's an example of how you're kind of harmonizing all of this user authentication across the entire network ecosystem, right? So it's one username and one password to access anything on the network, right? So again, lots of options on network, on authentication protocols for network devices. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about threats. So what is a threat? It's the potential for the occurrence of a harmful event which can lead to an attack, right? That's what we're talking about with threats. And there's lots of different network type threats. The classic is uh, denial of service or distributed denial of service. The idea here is that you're somehow flooding a network with packets that makes the network too busy to respond to legitimate requests. And it, and it basically prevents people from being able to access network resources, right? So it's a denial of service attack. A teardrop attack is when you send mangled packets and fragments with overlapping and oversized payloads to a target system to try to get them to crash. Um, you could do sequence number attacks, which is where you're manipulating the acknowledgement numbers and sequence numbers. In the lab this week, we're going to take a look at what those acknowledgements and sequence numbers actually look like, right? And how we could actually sniff that traffic and we can see some of those acknowledgement numbers and sequence numbers. Um, a smurf attack or a fraggle attack is where well, a Smurf attack is using ICMP echo requests. A Fraggle attack is using uh, UDP packets to flood a network, basically to cause a denial of service attack, um, you know, by getting a lot of nodes on the network to send packets that aren't needed, right? And I'll talk about how that works. The ping of death. Um, now, the ping of death was a, um, a way to construct an ICMP echo request in, I, in with the internet protocol. Um, but... Uh, the the uh, that attack doesn't work anymore, right? It used to work against Windows machines. You used to be able to send the ping of death to a Windows computer and it would cause it to blue screen and crash, right? If anyone remembers the old blue screen of death, right? It was one way you could send these echo requests on a network and start getting computers to blue screen all across the network. Microsoft has obviously fixed that vulnerability, right? But why do I talk about it here? It's not so much that we have to specifically protect against the ICMP echo request ping of death, right? Uh, it's a well-known attack that's uh, already protected on most devices implicitly. But the reason I talk about it is because it's, it's an interesting example of how somebody discovered a vulnerability by taking advantage of um, you know, how these protocols work, right? Having a deep understanding of these protocols and understanding how they work and manipulating them under the hood, right? Which in the lab, I kind of give you a, a, a taste of that, right? So in the lab, we get kind of just a, we barely get a taste of, of how to start looking under the hood at these protocols and the traffic to start to understand how it works. And, you know, people kind of pick away at that and find interesting and very creative ways to, to, attack systems right um so i think it's it's good to study this stuff because it, it gives you a sense of kind of the methodology of how attackers uh try to attack systems right so it's interesting to study these things um a sin flood is when we have a large volume of tcp sin packets which again consumes resources on a target system um you know i think i talked about stateful versus stateless uh 
firewalls, right? Because I talked about firewalls already in this course, even though it's the topic really in this week. I talked about it early in the course. You know, I covered what firewalls are and a little bit of how they work. And in that section, I talked about how firewalls can either be stateful or stateless. And one of the things I talked about is how a stateful firewall uses a lot more resources than a stateless. So we typically will do our stateless rules first. That way we're using fewer resources by the time you get to a stateful rule. Well, to, for those stateful rules to work, they have to rely on acknowledgement and sequence numbers and the, those types of packets. So, or I should say segments, not packets. So what if I send a large volume of SYN packets, right? A, you know, that, that have the synchronization number, right? Um, and I force systems to have to calculate those and figure out if they, you know, if they're relevant or not, and it's gonna use up resources and it's just another form of a denial of service attack, right? They can cause a network to not work. Uh, worms are automated self-replicating programs that can do damage, right? It is, some people call them a network virus. We're going to talk about viruses and worms in much more detail uh, the week after next, right? So next week, we're going to talk about remote access. The week after that, we're going to talk about application level attacks. Um, I'll cover that in a little bit more detail, but, uh, but again, this is something else we have to protect against, uh, spam or unsolicited email, right? Tremendous amount of network traffic today is is spam right um, I remember for a while and, and it's not like this anymore but there was a time when something like 70 percent of internet traffic was actually spam right and of course with things like Netflix and Amazon Prime right um, video streaming services you know they're they're I think they're now the bulk of internet traffic these days but uh, but spam is certainly still a problem and something that we, you know, we have some various tools available for us to try to limit the amount of spam. And again, we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail when we talk about network applications and, and some of the network security or security implications of uh, network applications later in the course. Uh, and phishing emails, of course, is a big problem. Farming, which is an attack on DNS that redirects access to legitimate sites, to imposter sites, right? So with farming, what you're doing is you're you're trying to poison DNS. So people get, uh, you know, when they go to a web address, it gets the wrong IP address. They end up at kind of a clone of the real website and it's capturing people's information. Um, you know, for example, I can make a fake version of uh, Toronto Dominion Bank. And when people land on that fake bank website, they don't know they're on the fake website and they put their credentials in and I capture those credentials and then I redirect them to the real bank website, log them in automatically, and then they never even know what happened, right? So that's what they're talking about with farming attacks. Um, so again, lots of different network threats. We're going to talk about some of these in more detail later in the course, but for right now, we're going to kind of concentrate on these sort of low-level network attacks that work at the protocol level. So there's some additional attack vectors, right, beyond these vulnerabilities I was talking about. Um, certainly, if you have software bugs, if you have configuration errors, things aren't configured properly. Uh, for example, the firewall, right? Um, in the lab, we take, you know, we disable our firewall because we're going to test stuff. Well, what if you forget to turn it back on, right? That's a configuration error that leaves us open to attack. Uh, no matter how hard we try, uh, you know, there's very little technology that can prevent social engineering attacks, right? Um, you can make passwords as strong as you possibly can, but if people are just going to give it to somebody, right, then it doesn't help. Uh, so social engineering, and we're going to talk more in detail about how social engineering works and how people use that later in the course. And then you have worms and viruses, Trojan horses, uh, you know, host and peer scanning, right, using some of the tools that we're going to look at tonight. People can use those tools against us. We can use them to evaluate our own network security, but other people can use them to evaluate our network security as well, right? Um, so it's important to know those tools exist and how they work and what people can use them uh, to do with our networks. So how do we mitigate this? Uh, so prevention and mitigation. So the first thing, of course, is firewalls. We talked about firewalls earlier. And typically firewalls, the, the typical architecture with firewalls in most networks is we have various zones, right? So you've got the public internet, which I've signified here with a cloud, right? Some, everybody calls the internet the cloud, right? Um, the international symbol for everyone else's computer, right? Um, so that'll, you know, everything from outside your network is going to hit a firewall. That firewall is going to pass traffic to things like web servers and FTP servers and email servers. And you can think of that first firewall as kind of, you know, if you think about an office building, you've got, you know, in most office buildings, when you first walk into the building, you're in this big lobby, right? Uh, you know, think about one of these big office buildings in Philadelphia, right? And you walk in and you're in the lobby 
and all the public facing stuff is in that lobby, right? Um, but you can't really get past that lobby unless you're an internal employee, right? You know, go to the Comcast building, right, in Philadelphia. You're not going to get past the lobby of the Comcast building unless you actually work at Comcast, right? Or you have a meeting with somebody and you're explicitly allowed in, right? So somebody reached out to you and gave permission for you to come in. But if you're just kind of walking in off the street, and you could do that, you could walk in off the street and walk into the Comcast building lobby and you can look around and, you know, sometimes the holidays are coming up, right? And they have the big holiday, although it won't be this year, right? Because of COVID, they're probably not going to do any of that stuff. But, you know, you can watch the little holiday show they have in the lobby. And a lot of buildings have stuff like that, right? And that's kind of what we do with our firewalls, right? That first firewall is the, kind of that entrance into our lobby. Here's all the public facing things that you can access, like our web server and our FTP server and our email server, right? For all that traffic coming in. And then behind that, you know, you've got the kind of turnstiles to get into where the elevators are to get to the real offices, right? And that's going to be all of our assets that are going to be protected that no one's allowed to access unless, you know, there's a connection that's initiated from inside the network that says, you know, that the firewall says, oh, that's traffic that I'm allowed to let in because somebody requested that, right? Somebody requested a meeting, so I'm allowed to go through those turnstiles into the actual office complex. So the top is typically called the uh, the the public zone, right? So we have that in Firewall D. We call it the public zone, right? That's what it's supposed to be. The public zone is whatever interface is connected to, you know, the internet, right? Now think about your Linux machine. Uh, in our in our Google environment, our Linux machine only has one IP address, right? It only has that one interface. But could it have multiple interfaces? Absolutely. You could have a Linux machine that's connected. You know, one interface connects to one network and the other one connects to another network. So go back to that topology diagram I showed you in the very beginning, right? That first slide I showed you with the different topologies and I showed you two star topologies connected with a router in the middle. Well, that router in the middle could be a Linux machine, right? It's not common, but it could be. Uh, you know, we talked about IP tables earlier in the course and a little bit about how, how IP tables works. And, you know, if, if, if one of those networks could be the public network, the other one could be the trusted network, right? And I can, you know, and that's how you would create in, in Firewall D, you would assign, and we haven't done this in this course, but you can actually assign the different zones in Firewall D to different network interfaces on your server and define how they can communicate with each other. Um, and really, it probably uses IP tables under the hood for that to work. So, so the red zone at the top, right? That's where, you know, we have to, we're very suspect of any traffic in that red zone. The yellow zone is, you know, kind of that quasi trusted zone because there could be traffic that's coming from inside, but there could also be traffic from the outside. So we have to be cautious in the yellow zone. And then we have the green zone where, you know, we pretty much don't, you know, we allow pretty much all traffic to move around within the green zone and we allow traffic out of the green zone to the red zone but we're very careful about letting traffic from the red zone getting into the yellow and even more so the green zone on the bottom, right? That's unsolicited traffic, unless we have an established connection, right? So you can establish a connection from the green zone to the red zone and that traffic's gonna traverse back and forth between those zones. That's not a problem, right? That's sort of like somebody, you know, I made an appointment with somebody so they're gonna let me through the lobby, right? I'm not just unsolicited walking in off the street and trying to get into the elevator to go up to the 13th floor or whatever it is. Uh, although maybe they don't have a 13th floor, right? Uh, a lot of buildings don't. All right. So that's a little bit about uh, the zoning with firewalls. So let's talk about some of these different attacks. Uh, first one is spoofing and de uh, denial, distributed denial of service attacks. How does this work? So let's say you've got a router, you've got two nodes on a network, right? Or two networks rather, right? I've got network one, I've got network two, and they're both interconnecting through a router, right? I've got a packet that the source is network one and the destination is somewhere on network two. And that packet flows into the router. The router gets that packet and then it says, oh, I know where that needs to go. I send it off to network two, right? But then what if I have an attacker and uh, you know, by default, their source is going to be the internet. By the way, that's an I on there, not a one. I, I should have used the different uh, different numbers on the left, right? Because um, it looks an awful lot like a one, but that's supposed to be an I on the right side. So that little packet, the source is the internet or I, and, and the destination is two. And that router should be smart enough that when that packet arrives, it says, 
well, wait a minute. Um, network two is in my trusted zone. I can't just let unsolicited traffic in and it gets rid of that packet, drops that packet. So then the attacker has to get smart. He has to say, okay, well, what if instead I make my source address one to try to trick the router into saying, oh, that came from one. Let me go ahead and route that over to number two because it came from somebody I can trust, right? And I can relay that message. Um, and then what if the attacker does that? What if they set the source to the router, right? Um, you know, and start sending a whole bunch of packets to the router. Uh, and that's really how a Smurf attack works, right? Um, and also a Fraggle attack, which uses UDP. So a Fraggle attack is where we spoof the um, uh, we spoof the router into uh, uh, thinking that it was a, that it's the broadcast address. So whatever packets we're sending that router in UDP, it's going to try to broadcast it, right? It, it, it to across the entire network, right? So we spoof the um, the sources being the broadcast address. So when it tries to respond, it just starts sending packets all over the place and you get this storm of packets and it shuts down the network. With an ICMP or, or a Smurf attack, you're using ICMP where you're spoofing the return address, right? So for example, you know, let's say I start sending ICMP packets to all the computers on my network and I make the, uh, and I spoof the source address to be the router. Well, where are all the ICMP echo responses going to go? They're all going to go to the router, right? And the router is going to get overwhelmed and it's going to shut down and now nobody can communicate on the network, right? So a variety of different attacks based on spoofing, right? Fraggle and Smurf are two of the, uh, the most uh, common. Now, as I said before, a lot of network devices, um, they will implicitly block these well-known attacks, right? Why do we talk about them? Again, I talk about these because I think it's important to study them because it helps give us some insight into how people have discovered these different vulnerabilities and some of the creative ways that people find these different vulnerabilities. All right, let's take a look at routing tables, right? So when I talk about how routing tables work, let's say I've got two points on a map and I wanna get a letter from one place to the other. And this actually happened to me once, right? I, I, I was sending a letter uh, to my sister. I was sending something. It wasn't a letter. I was sending a package or something to my sister. My sister lives in Philadelphia. I live in New Jersey, right? Now, I know this map isn't quite to scale, right? Because, uh, you know, obviously Philadelphia is not way out in the middle of Pennsylvania somewhere, but you get the idea, right? We're relatively close together. And I put something in the mail for her and the post office did not deliver it directly to, um, to my sister. And I'll show you an example here. So it was taking a long time excuse me, for the package to get there. And I was trying to figure out why. So I put the routing number in on USPS.com and I started following the path that my package was taking and it was going all over the place. Um, it was, you know, I was trying to send the package to my sister in Pennsylvania coming from, you know, where I lived at the time, which was in Berlin, New Jersey. And it went to Philadelphia, then it went to Washington State, then it went to Seattle, then it went to Tacoma, then it went to Kent, and then it went to Warrendale, which still wasn't near my sister, um, and kept just kind of bouncing around, right? And I, you know, I got the map out and I'm tracing, okay, where the heck is this package going? It's like sort of bouncing around all these places out here, and then eventually it kind of made it all the way back um, and made it to my sister's doorstep, right? But this is a type of attack where we're, you know, in networking, we can take advantage of these flaws in routing to try to um, to attack networks, right? So let's take a look at an example of this, right? So so I'm gonna kind of expand on that previous example with the routing tables, right? Let's let's do a bigger example. Let's, let's pretend we've got lots of networks, right? So each one of these circles represents an entire network. Before I only showed a router in the middle and then a bunch of nodes on either side of that router. So I had two kind of networks on either side of a router. But here, each one of these circles represents a router. So, each, so within each one of those circles is a whole bunch of nodes that are in these different networks connected through different interfaces, right? And if I have a packet, so let's say at S1, I have a packet that I want to get to S6, which is the router at the bottom, that network on the bottom. So the first thing that the router is going to do is it's going to say, okay, network X S6 to get there, I can go to S7 and that has a metric of one. So then it's going to forward that packet to S7 and then to get from S6 or S7 to S6, the next top is S6, right? That's pretty easy and it gets there. No problem, right? Um, one of the things you can do is, you know, let's say I'm trying to get this packet to S6. Um, you can have multiple routes. So look at, look at the S, S1 at the top. 
there are two paths to get from S1 to uh, S6. It can either go through S4 or it can go through S7. So in my example here, uh, we might have a route where we manually create a metric that says that S4 is the preferred route over S7. So then um, S6 goes through S4 instead of S7 and ends up on S6. What if an attacker were to start to poison these routing tables and uh, forcing the, the routing to go in different directions, right? And there's actually kind of a famous example of this attack where we poison routing tables is the Chinese government, right? The Chinese government was poisoning routing tables so that more traffic was going through China um, before you might be sending traffic from somebody within the United States to somebody else in the United States. And researchers were finding that a lot of that traffic was actually traversing through ISPs in China before coming back over to the United States. Now, not only is that inefficient because it's going through China, which is clear across the Pacific Ocean, right? Although technically the, that probably goes you know, up over the North Pole or something, right? Um, or through satellites or whatever. But you know, it's clear, clear halfway around the world before the traffic ends up where we're trying to send it. Uh, but the bigger concern is why would the Chinese government want traffic going through their routers, right? Well, because once traffic starts going through their devices, they have access to the payload, right? You're going to see that in the lab. Once traffic is going through our router, our switch, or our firewall, we can access the payload of that traffic. And you're going to see that work in the lab when we use the TCP dump utility, which is a very basic utility for um for looking at the payload in uh, in segments. So in any event, that's uh, a little bit about how routing works. Um, so in another example here, let's say I need to get this packet to S8, right? Now all of a sudden I have a lot more paths to get to uh, all the way over to S8, right? So first it's gonna pass that to S7. Then S7, it's gonna say, oh, I've got, um, my next hop is to go to S0. And then S0 is gonna say, well, my next hop is S2. And then S2 says my next hop is S8. And eventually that packet's gonna make its way over, excuse me, to S8. Now, as far as routing tables goes, a couple of things that we can look at that will help us with uh, network security. For, so first of all, if S7 in this example is, you know, we have internal S1, S4, and S6 are all internal to S7, right? So that's, you might call that the, the trusted network. Um, and then everything on the other interface, that interface on the right side is the untrusted network. One thing we can look for is any traffic. You know, if you think about this, if traffic is a, is coming in on a public interface that's facing the internet, we should never see IP addresses that are locally scoped, right? That are that are local IP addresses. So that's one thing we can look for. And in fact, if any of that traffic coming in is is has a, an IP address that is in the RFC 1918 space right so rfc 1918 defines the ranges of ip addresses that are private ip addresses i should never see traffic coming in from a public internet facing interface with an rfc 1918 address which means i could just drop any packet that, that that's in that range right um so that's the first thing i could do i could also drop anything that's coming into my interface that's not assigned by iana right so iana uh, basically assigns all IP addresses. And, you know, you can kind of, you know, with that list of IP addresses, there are many IP addresses that you should never see traffic coming from for a variety of reasons. So you could use that published IANA um, assigned IP addresses to kind of determine, okay, well, this block of IPs would never be legitimate. So we can throw those away. And um, here's an IP address that's never been assigned. If I, if somebody's trying to connect to me using an IP address that was never assigned to any entity, well, it's probably an attacker, right? So that would get dropped, right? Um, so those are various ways that we can protect our, our network. We can also use pointer records, right? So you can use a DNS lookup. So you, your, your, your network security device could say, okay, I got a request and the IP address that it came in on, when I do a, when I check its pointer record with NS lookup, it doesn't come back to anything legitimate, right? Nobody nobody has an FQDN registered to that IP, so that's probably an indication that it's not something real, right? So it would drop that packet. So lots of different little things that we can do to try to detect this uh, these spoof attacks. Now, another example is uh, RFC 3704, which you can look up. Uh, talks a little bit about um, um, 
excuse me, RFC 3704 is reverse path, right? Unicast reverse path forwarding. So the idea is here is let's say I've got a packet that arrives into that center, you know, uh, uh, router. It says the source is S4 and the destination is S6, right? Well, S4 is all the way on the left. And if that packet arrives into F7 from S0's interface, right? Well, it should be smart enough to say, wait a minute, traffic coming in on that path can't possibly be from S4 because only uh, traffic coming in from the left interface, the interface on the left hand side could be coming from S4. So it should be smart enough to just drop that packet, right? And that's what RFC 3704 defines. It's, uh, it's dropping packets that just semantically don't make sense, essentially. All right, another type of TCP attack is what we call the lamp test attack. Um, so if we look at a segment header, right? What if somebody just starts setting these flags to all kinds of things, right? Um, sometimes people call it a lamp test attack. Sometimes people call it a Christmas tree attack. You're lighting up all the flags like a Christmas tree. And the idea here is to just try sending packets that or, or segments that have all these different flags set to confuse uh, software. It doesn't know what to do. And, and maybe it's going to use up resources while it's, you know, caching these, these segments because it doesn't know what they are. Or maybe it's going to crash the device, right? That used to work. That used to be a pretty common attack. Um, it used to be fairly effective, but not so much anymore. It's not as effective as it used to be. Uh, a man in the middle attack is essentially when you're setting up this three-way handshake, but instead of the handshake being directly with the with, with the the party with which you want to communicate with the TCP and you know layer three and so forth, right? Instead, an attacker sits in the middle and they're receiving the request for a connection. They then um, uh, they then request a connection with who you're trying to talk to. And then uh, this happens with the attacker sitting in the middle. So they set up a three-way handshake with the requester and independently with the receiver. And then they're kind of moving that traffic. So they actually become kind of like a router, right? Um, this is uh, this this type of attack. <clears throat> excuse me. Used to be um, this used to be a, a kind of attack that people would look out for, but. You know, any any more, I think in modern networks, a lot of times we're actually initiating these attacks. We're actually doing these on purpose, right? Because in corporate networks, we want to capture that information, right? So uh, to me, a lot of that maybe is, is starting to break networks because now we're, we're kind of legitimizing these man in the middle attacks. You go to a Starbucks and you connect to their network or you go to a, a Marriott or a Hilton or something and they have these proxy servers you have to log into and connect to. Uh, you know, with your room number and your name or something. And then when you go to websites, it says that the website, you know, the certificate is bad because it's going through some kind of proxy. And, you you know, you basically are just people are getting complacent and they're just saying, well, I'll, you know, I'll accept it anyway and keep going. Um, but browsers like Chrome are starting to get pretty good at detecting that stuff. And they'll tell you that, hey, you, you probably don't want to trust this website because it, it doesn't appear to be from a legitimate source. Um, so that's a man in the middle attack. Uh, again, these are, uh, you know, I talked about a bunch of different attacks, um, but all is not lost. There's there's also the ability to to try to prevent these. So some of the vulnerabilities beyond these attacks, um, you can have unnecessary open ports on your network devices. You can have systems that aren't patched. You can have outdated configurations, default passwords that no one changed. Um, you can have exposed cabling. Years ago, I remember I went to go work with a customer that had a uh, they had an MRI machine that came in once a week to this hospital out you know was outside in the parking lot and they had a uh, uh, Ethernet jack outside the building and that jack was just sitting outside the building with no cover no lock nothing right and you could just walk up with a laptop jack into it and you would be on the hospital network and you could start you know using the tools that you're going to see in the in the uh, practical assignment you could start using those tools and start you know, looking around the network and trying to find, you know, vulnerabilities, right? Without even going inside the building, right? Um, so that's certainly a concern. So these are a lot of the things that we're trying to look out for uh, from, you know, uh, as far as network security goes. It's not always about all the technology that I talk about, you know, and firewalls and things like that. You know, there's a lot of obvious things we have to look out for as well. There are countermeasures available to us, um, access control lists, routers, firewalls, right? Um, things like that, intrusion detection systems, which we're going to talk about in week 13. So 
Um, towards the end of the course, I'll talk about IDSs, both network and host-based IDSs. I'll also talk about intrusion prevention and detection systems. Uh, in week 14, we're going to talk a little about data leakage protection uh, or prevention systems. This is what prevents people from emailing sensitive information or copying sensitive information off their computers outside the network um, and how to classify data to prevent that from happening, right? Um, and then protection of network cabling, right? Make sure we don't have that Ethernet port sitting outside the building that anybody could just jack into and start doing things on our network. All right, so that's pretty much all I have this week. And if you have any questions about network security, let me know. Uh, but also there'll be a lab that you will, or I call them practical assignments, right? There's a practical assignment where you're going to use the Nmap tool and TCP dump to kind of play around with some, uh, and see a little bit about how networks, uh, network security works, right? Um, to see how these low level protocols work and how people can, uh, you know, really kind of figure out things about your server and how we can mitigate some of that. That's really the topic for the practical assignment. So we're not going to actually create firewall rules because we did that early in the course. We already played with firewall D. We already know how to configure firewall D. Uh, this week, I'm kind of concentrating on more on why we use firewall D, right? Like why it's important to have that. And what are some of the other little things that we can do to try to help protect our networks and protect our servers? All right. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.